All right, so last time we, uh, we talked about operator overloading, and, I, um, and that's what we are supposed to talk about in the next day that you're coming in for the lecture. Um, but I'm just going to go through it if anybody wants to, to know about it. And also talking about the constructor and the structure and to see if we have any questions over there. So we said uh, whenever you create a class to guarantee that certain stuff happens when the object is created, right after the object is created, we create certain routines. We call them constructors. These constructors are not functions. They are automatically called by system to do certain actions when an object is created. Constructors like functions can be overloaded with different types of arguments. You can create uh, an object in many different ways. So that's not the one. Oh, that's the, the other one. Let me open the domain for the container. So. So yeah, as I was saying, you can create uh, you can create an object in many different ways, um, and uh, the way you create it is exactly how the com uh, the constructor is created. So, if I actually, um, for example, create a uh, container and I say it has only one argument that's a constant character pointer. Then there's the routine we created for the constructor over here with one argument will be called, which in return is going to do whatever it's supposed to do with that one routine. Uh, and uh, uh, different types of constructors will be called automatically exactly like uh, a function with the, uh, the overload that they have, with the signature that they have. We talked about uh, initialization area. We said there's an, uh, if you want, the properties of the, if you want the properties of the class to actually uh, get initialized to certain values before the constructor gets, is getting called, you have the initialization area. The initialization area is where everything happens and uh, um, where everything gets initialized before the con con uh, container is called. You can uh, literally put the name of the property and what you want to initialize it to. Initializer can be done using uh, either the, the aggregated initialization we, we learned, the universal one with curly brackets, or with parentheses. It doesn't make any difference. They're all the same. As you see over here, volume is being initialized to 220 with parentheses, where amount is initialized to 220. We said there is a specific type of thing, there is a specific thing you have to be careful about where you set stuff in the initialization area. The order in which they are getting initialized must match the order of the properties you have in the class. Otherwise, you're going to get a warning telling that uh, the initialization sequence is not right. Uh, another important thing we need to know is that if you initialize properties within the class itself, that initialization is not going to happen if you have something in the initialization area. So initialization area supersedes that. Okay? Um, so if I say over there content is null PTR and I do something else in the initialization here, that's going to actually overwrite it. And um, yeah, and we said that this initialization area can initialize anything, any properties of the class. It doesn't matter what. In future, we're going to learn inheritance, where you build an object, a class, out of an already existing class. Like we have a class for bicycle. We create a class for the motorcycle. And we say motorcycle is a bicycle with an engine. Therefore, you don't need to rewrite the whole bicycle. The whole bicycle is implemented. You use everything that a bicycle has. You just put an engine for it and do some modifications. Instead of pedaling, you have to do the throttle thingy and the brake. So you do modifications to the bicycle, but you don't need to write everything from scratch. If that's the case, initialization area could be used to initialize the base class to the one that you are inheriting from. We're going to learn all those things later on. We know what the concept of inheritance is. We learned it at the beginning of the semester. We just don't know the syntax for it. 
uh, they'll come to it soon. It's not a very tough thing to do. And uh, the destructor, however, is the only thing that, uh, there's only one thing that you have. It's exactly like a constructor. You should not call it. It's, it will be called automatically. If any code exists in the constructor that is shared with something else, put it in a function and call that function. The exact same thing with the constructors. If your constructors are supposed to do the same thing, you cannot call one constructor in another. What you need to do is to actually uh, put those things in a function and call the function. Okay? There are newer syntax that you're going to learn in 3.4.5, but that's the extent of what we know now. So that's that. If this guarantees that uh, you can prepare your class before things happen and you can uh, clean up after your class when it's gone, especially when you have resources outside of your class. When I say resource out of, outside of the class, inside the class, you know what the scopes are. You're going to do a quiz on it today, right? You know what the scopes are. Like, like if you have a variable inside a function, that variable only exists inside a function and it dies after. You know what a file scope is. That variable is, is within a file. It's not visible to any other files. And it's alive while your program is running. Then it's going to die. And then we have a class scope where you have a variable inside the class. While the object is alive, the variables are alive. And when they're gone, the variables will be gone. So having said that, uh, uh, you have to make sure that all those variables are taken care of using their constructors and destructors as you are uh, going through the uh, scope of uh, variables. So anything that you have inside the class, you don't need to worry about it because it's within the scope of the class. When the class goes away, that goes away too. For example, in here, M content, the character pointer, we don't need to care about it. The character pointer will go away by itself. But where character pointer is pointing to, that's ours. It's not inside the class. That's somewhere outside. You have a pointer pointing to a chunk of memory that is not, with, not within, within the scope of your class. So when your class is gone, M content will be thrown away. Therefore, the memory will be lost, hence the memory leak. Because of that fact, we have constructors and destructors to make sure all the resources of the class are occupied properly when the object gets created, and they're all removed when the object, before the object is gone. Okay, that was the purpose of uh, constructors and destructors. So that's that. Um, we gave examples with dynamic memory allocation. You have done workshops on it. And that's that. Any questions on those things? Workshop, actually, you have another workshop. Workshop four is on that, right? Workshop four is on constructors and destructors, which I wanted to talk about, but if you want to. Talk about it. We have an overview. It's on YouTube. You have, you've seen it over there. And um, we've got to check to see if the audio of that one is actually misplaced. I, haven't, I have to check that one. Um, uh, the next thing I, t uh, so we are okay down to this point. Reviews is okay. Everybody's happy with this? Yes. Why we use the structure? Because you want to clean up after you're gone. My apologies. Let me shut this up. Yes, I am recording. I'm recording my cell phone ringing. <laughs> yes, you were saying? Anything. Anything you need. If I say only deleting memory, then I'm lying because that's not always the case. Sometimes. You have resource, like let, now the only thing that you know is dynamic memory allocation. But later on, when you go to networking, you open a port to do communication through certain channel. The open port is not within your class. It's within the memory of the OS and the hardware. And after you're done, you want to close the communication, you have to do it in a destructor. Anything that is outside of the class, you have to take care of it. It's exactly like all the things that you're carrying. You're having your computer with you. You're coming to class, your constructor puts your computer on the table. Yeah. When you are leaving, your destructor picks it up and goes with oh, you. Yeah. 
Okay, that's what it is. So essentially, construct your well, but you carry your head with you. No, it's with you. You go anywhere, your head comes with you. Right? It's part of you. It doesn't go away. But your glasses, that needs a constructor. You have to. You're waking up. Constructor going to bed. Destructor going to putting it down. Exactly. Beautiful. Now, if that's the case, so what the suggestion was, so if going to picnic is, and laying this stuff, I'm just repeating because I don't know if it captured your audio, because it's going to be funny if I talk about it and nobody knows what it is. So the suggestion was that when we are going to picnic and we lay down everything and get ready for the picnic, that's constructor, and when we are leaving, collecting all the garbage and stuff and clean, it, clean afterwards, clean uh, uh, after ourselves, when we are leaving, that's the destructor. Now, my question is that, if that's the case, what would, what would be the name of the class? Picnic, yeah. So the class picnic, constructor of the class picnic, lays down everything, yada, 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 and when picnic is over, it cleans up everything and puts everything in garbage and packs everything, nothing's left, so no footprint after us leaving the beautiful place we got into. You're talking about line 17, we can put it on 20, you can put it anywhere you want. Anywhere? Uh, no, not outside of the class. Uh, but so, can we put this? Can we put it in a private part of the class? Then the object cannot be destroyed because it's private. So you have to put it in a public part anywhere in class you want. Anywhere? Yeah, it's exactly like a function. You can put it in, but it's not a function. But exactly like a function, you can put it anywhere. But when you do it like this. It's organized and beautiful. First, oh, yeah, the first thing, no argument, then one argument. That th don't put everything like destructor over there, constructor over there. Don't do it like that. Be organized and nice and beautiful. Thank you. Are we good with this? Are we OK, one? Are we OK, two? OK. You want me to review the operator overloads, too, or you want to do it when we come for the lecture, actually, of the operator? No? Yeah, because you have nothing to do with it. There's no op there is no uh, workshop for it. There is no assignment for it. There's nothing for it. The lecture is coming the, uh, the next day you're coming in. So th that's when we're going to talk about operator. What, <laughs> what are you laughing? <laughs> what? Operator overloading? <laughs> that's a very funny thing. It is, a, it is one of the most beautiful features of C++. It's an amazing, like the, the, I, it's so beautiful that I actually remember that I was actually studying C because I self-taught C++ to myself. When I actually got to that concept, I had goosebumps. I'm like, wow, <laughs> what I can do with this thing. I mean, like, you can literally create your own language, okay? It's, it's a beautiful thing. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's the ultimate type of uh, uh, face of polymorphism in your, in your application. All right, now that we did lots of nerdish stuff, <laughs> spoke nerdish things, like uh, object-oriented language is beautiful, and uh, OP244 is a peak, uh, and uh, operator overloading is a peak of it, but yeah. So any other question, suggestion, objection? All right. So. Let me stop the recording and pause the recording, but uh, I can continue later on. So, so talking about workshop four, um, I'm going to bring it up. Watch the overview. Very quickly, I went through every single thing that you need to know. So we, need to, we don't need to bore ourselves with that. If you have a question, I'll explain it to you, but uh, everything is there, it's just redundant if I mention it over here. Um, the only thing that I want to tell you is this. So workshop two, we are actually doing, uh, for the lab and DIY, we do two opposite, opposite sides of the same application. So for the lab part, you are creating uh, a class for a seat on an airplane. 
So essentially information about the seat on an airplane. And you have to take a look at the airplane and see exactly what is. So your validation is through this picture. So you can actually see if you're within row. So rows one or four, valid. Five, wrong. Six, wrong. Seven is valid. You come right up to 15. 16, 17, 18, 19, not acceptable. 20 to 38, it is acceptable. When you are between one and four, A, B, E, F are the letters. There is no C, there is no D. When you're coming to seven, then A, B, C, D, E, F, everything is available right to the end. So you have to set, like, that, that's how your validation is supposed to happen. So you create the class for the seat, and the name of the passenger is dynamic, and that's how we test if you are doing the constructor and destructor properly or not. So the, the only thing that you need to worry about, so you have one, uh, character pointer that holds the name of the uh, passenger. You have one integer that holds the row, and you have one character that holds the, the letter of the seat. And that's your class. And you have constructor and destructors accordingly, and some formatting to print things properly, uh, so, and you know all that. So passenger should be printed in 40 characters, and when it's printed, it should be left justified, and uh, uh, empty spaces filled with dots. You do that with width, with fill, with justification, I, uh, set F iOS left, but you have to always make sure after you set iOS left or right, you have to always unset it to put uh, uh, C out back to its normal position. Otherwise, next printouts may come out ugly. You've got to be careful. So this should be your habit. If you set it to certain justification, immediately unset it. Don't think that setting to left can be not, can be over, you can overwrite it by setting it to right. Right is not opposite as of left. Remember that. Right, right has its own flag, left has its own flag. When you unset it, it removes those flags. So rem make sure you unset it. That's that one. Uh, the signature of the display is kind of weird. Um, it has all queries that you know. We create a function called allocate and copy. Okay? It's not Al Capone, it's allocate and copy, right? So allocate and copy, because you may need to do more than once in functions, it's a good idea to write it in a function and do, and do the allocation like that. And uh, what happens is that that measures the size. First, it checks, make sure str is not null, which means there is something to copy. Uh, then it goes to see if that something is empty or not. So it's like if I say coffee cup, there is no coffee cup here. So this is a null pointer. There is no coffee cup. But if I say water bottle, now for everyone who's listening to this, I'm actually pointing as a water bottle, at a water bottle. Now if I, and I say drink it, so first you're okay, but you now have to see if the bottle is empty or not. Otherwise you can't drink anything out of it, right? So I have to first point to an actual water bottle, and then the water bottle must not be empty. It's the same thing over here. First, the SDR should point to a string, which means not being null. Then you have to check to see if the first element is null or not, to see if the string has something in it. If the first element is null, it means it's an empty string. No dynamic memory allocation, right? All right, so first you check the null, then you check the thing. If these two things are OK, it means you actually have something to copy. <clears throat> then you get its length. If I were you, I would use the utils from last thing instead of using string. And you can always submit it with up1 to include the utilities. Um, yeah, do a string length, add one to it for the null. Do the allocation, and after allocation is done, string copy everything into the allocated thing, and you're done. Just to make sure that you can cascade it later on, which means do something in the same line later on, return the reference of the current object that is target of this. What is the syntax of target of this? Asterisk this. I'm not going to say asterisk this or start this. I say target of this because we said mention it properly, okay? So you return target of this, and that's the reference of the current object. So, and validating, 
uh, it tells you exactly what you need to do, validate this and that. So uh, with lab, I designed it in a way so anybody who were in the class, if you follow the instruction, you'll, be, you'll, you'll finish it in, in an hour and a half. And I'm serious. You will finish it in an hour and a half. OK, well, geez, he's laughing at me. So the, the, the code is like, no, no, no. You know how long it took me to write it? I was working on it for two days. It's not, it's not easy to, to, uh, to create a workshop because I have to write it. When I write it, I see it's too complicated. Then I simplify it. Then I look at it, and I see it's bad, and I simplify it, and I simplify it. Then I see there is no point to make it. I'm not asking anything. They have to, so it goes up and down like a sine wave. It was you overcomplicated, over oversimple, over, and until it find, goes to, so it's a very difficult thing to do. That's why it should be done a semester before for next semester in, a, in an ideal world. So uh, yeah, so let me just, let me pause. This is something that I am suffering from it every single semester as a computer programmer. There, I, hope, I wish there was a pill that you could take and you would get obsessive compulsive disorder. Because that's how you have to program. A programmer must be exact, obsessively. And I'm not joking. Still, people are asking for extension, and I keep sending them back the link. Follow the instructions. And they, they ask again, can I get it till tomorrow? And I say, follow the instructions, please, with red, bold, again. So. If you do not follow the instructions, you will not succeed in programming in your life. Go quit, go read geography, go do some, I don't know, go to the fire department. Actually, they have very difficult science too, so not even there. So yeah, that's actually tough. I gave the wrong, wrong example. <laughs> I don't know, go someplace that you have to memorize things and you can like, I don't know, essay writing, I don't know. So um, um, yeah, for, for computer program, you have to be exact. And please follow instructions. So follow instructions exactly as it tells you. I'm not telling you it's going to run at the first shot. But after two, three times of, of fixing and talking with one of your friends about the mistake that you had, you're going to be done in two hours. Try it. See if it works or not. And give me the feedback. And say, no, far that it took me nine hours. You know, the hoo hoo. OK, so, and I'll see if it's, if it's true or not. OK? But I think that's going to be true. Anyways. So that's that. So again, if just take a look at allocation and copy. I'm saying before validating the STR, be, uh, before validating the STR grid to be valid string, set the passenger and name ported to a null pointer. So I'm telling you exactly what to do before this and that. It literally telling you what to type, what to do. Okay, that's not the case in DIY, in here. Okay, so go through it step by step, and yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, you do that and you turn the reference of the C and reset is essentially setting it to a safe empty state by deallocating the passenger's name. I should have written delete square bracket passenger, no. Okay, deallocate, set the passenger name to null pointer, set the row and letter to zero and you're done. That's your, that's your reset. That's exactly 15 seconds of programming. Not 15, 30 seconds. Okay. Is empty just return to, to see if your, your passenger is null? OK? Um, if your passenger is null, it means it's an empty thing. Assigned, it means is this, are the seats valid? Seat numbers valid? So you already wrote the validation for the seat numbers. Just call that one and return it out for the seats that you have currently in class. If they are valid numbers, it means the seat is assigned. If it's not, it's not. And and that's it. The constructors calls the, so all these constructors that you see are recalling the, the functions that you have written. It's like seat, it calls the reset. The other one, uh, passenger name, calls the reset, then calls the allocation and copy. So by doing those things, these constructors are just calling functions to do the task they're doing. The, the other one, First resets, then uh, sets, uh, allocates and copies passenger name, then uh, calls the set function. And I said, C set method. And here, set actually sees, uh, sets the row and, and letter. So, so 
you, you do exactly this based, uh, and, and, and you'll be done. One of the things that is amazing when you become a professional in programming, you call functions you haven't written. When you do that, then the day you did that, the day that you actually call the program function that you haven't written and you are planning to write later, that's the time that you are entering into the zone of a professional programmer. When you are saying, okay, I have to set the row and a seat, you simply say set row and seat. And you put slash slash, do it later, and you go. That means now you understand what a module is. It means that one of the good things about the programming is that procrastinating in code, coding is good. When you are writing a code, you see, oh, that's too difficult, call a function. It doesn't exist. You'll write it later. What it does to your brain is that it's, uh, instead of picking up a huge one-ton load, you are dividing it into pieces. Now you pick two kilo per two kilo and two kilo, although it takes 500 pickups, but you can pick up the two tons of, of load. So when you see something is difficult, Imagine a function and call it and put a slash for it. And if you compile it, you see it doesn't work, put an empty prototype inside the class for it. And put it in a private side of the class, class because you don't want anybody else to call it. You want it to do it yourself. Just put it in a private part of the class and make it an empty function that does nothing. Okay? You can just right click on it and say, create the signature in yada yada. Automatically, it puts an empty thing over there for you and you're done. So even you, if, even you can compile your code, of course not running it, but you can compile your code, make sure your syntax is correct. So C does the same thing. The function sets row and letter if they are valid. Um, and then after the validation is, if, it, if they are not valid, it sets everything to zero. Row, letter, and passenger are queries returning the values of row, letter, and passenger. Okay, obviously the last one returns the address of the allocated memory. You don't need to care if it's null or not. If it's null, you return null. If it is, you, you don't return. You return the value. So it's the person who is actually calling the passenger's responsibility to check to see if the object is empty beforehand or not. Display receives the reference of an, an as O stream and returns a reference of O stream. And if you don't provide it with anything, it receives CL. Use it for now. So later on, when we are going later in the semester, uh, you'll understand <coughs> why we actually create our console display and read like this. We want to make these functions upgradable. You're going to later on find out what upgradable is. Okay? but we will make it upgradable. If you do it like that, it is upgradable. Look at the main testing it and you kind of find out. Every single thing that writes in C language, writes on devices stuff, is a type of O stream. Remember bicycle, I'm gonna say motorcycle is a bicycle. So reading into a file is an O stream, but instead of console, it's a file. Therefore, I can use this for that too. How? Because you don't need to know, but we'll find out uh, later on. We'll learn how to implement it. For now, just use it. So you do it like this, and you'll see I actually read from a file instead of reading from, a, from the screen. You don't need to worry how. That's my tester program. As long as you write your function as it reads from console properly, it's going to read from file properly too. That's the beauty of object orientation. So yes, so that's the display. It shows you exactly how to show uh, the, 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 the name. The name could be up, could, is a dynamic name up to 70 characters, but you are only showing the first 40. You have two choices. Either manually create a function that does this, which means prints only up to 40, and if it reaches to zero, it keeps printing dots until it reaches 40. So you manually write that yourself and put it in the... Uh, private part of the function, or you use set with and fill with dot, and instead of copying the 71 characters, you create a local variable of 41 characters, you copy the first 40 characters using str copy that we have in utils, or strn copy of string header file, and after copying the first 40, you print the 40 instead of 71, and it does it automatically. So because it's only print 40, you can do that, And 
The read is very simple. You simply read up to a comma, and then you read an integer, and, uh, and uh, you read an integer and a letter. That's all. Easy breezy. So read, uh, first read an uh, first set it to an object to an empty state to make sure if read fails, object is empty. Then you extract three, uh, three, three values, a character string with a length of 70 plus one, assuming the name cannot be more than 70 characters, an integer, uh, a character for the letter, and uh, uh, so these are the things. So for name, you are actually using get line, and then you're skipping a comma, then you get the set seat number, then you get seat letter, and you're done. Okay? So let me separate these two. So I should separate these two. Because these three are actually these. These four are implementation of these three. Uh, Oh, there's another one. Whoops. There's so many. There we go. So we are saying character string with length of yada, 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 an integer, a character. So oh, in the following format, I have to put a space over here, and then it's going to be fine. There you go. That's better. So you read these three in following format. So you read the character, integer, uh, uh, and, a, and a single character. Name, use, get line. Stop at comma. That's going to skip the comma. Seat number, you just read an integer. It will automatically stop at the letter. Then read a single letter. And at the end, you can ignore one backslash in. And you're done. OK? And if throughout all these, uh, C in fails, it means something went wrong, okay? Which we are not going to um, go through that much. And the tester program for it works as follows. And this is something that you need to, so obviously it tests everything that uh, a seed can be. So it goes through all the things that the seat is supposed to do uh, to make sure everything's good. <clears throat> then uh, uh, it comes over here uh, and checks reading. Check checking the reading. Don't type those things. If you're on matrix, if you're on putty, this is all you need to do to copy. You just do a copy and let go. And if you right click, it's going to type it. That's how copying on putty works. On DOS, you have to highlight enter and then do the same thing right click do not type everything there is a reason i put the stuff you want to enter i don't want you to keep entering and make typing mistakes and say damn it i put a comma or whatever i'm not supposed to or so on and so forth so that shows if you can actually read it and these readings that you see are all coming from the file okay all the uh, our uh, passengers with their files and some of them uh, they don't have an assigned seat and some of them do and so on and so forth, OK? All right. I just go through internet on shows that Simpsons, Star Wars, uh, uh, Family Guy, uh, <laughs> all these things. Uh, yeah, anyways. So that's that. So that's the, um, the lab part. The DIY is the exact opposite, which means in DIY, we give you the seat, the ticket. And then you have to create it. So we are giving you the code for a tour passenger. So we are saying a tour passenger, this class is implemented, and you have it, everything works. It's a tour passenger. It has a character named 41. Uh, and it has a ticket number. And it has a default constructor. There is no other constructor for it. Uh, so 
essentially um, when it gets created aromatically, uh, when uh, we, it gets created and sets everything to what it's supposed to be. When you issue it, it automatically sets a new ticket number. So you're going to have a ticket number, and it uh, sets the passenger name to the, to the passenger that is coming and shows the passenger in a specific format and tells you if the passenger is valid or not. So these are the things that the passenger does. Your job is to create a tour bus. And a tour bus could be in four, three different formats either four passenger or 16 passenger or 22 passenger. Okay, so anything other than that is invalid. The catch over here is that the tour bus holds tour passengers in an array that is dynamic, a dynamic array of tour passengers. So you create a dynamic array of tour passengers and then uh, those uh, the, the dynamic array of tour passengers is either 4, 16, or 22. It cannot be any other size. Um, and the functions that you're going to create is uh, first uh, a, a constructor that receives the number of passengers. And you, if the number is invalid, you don't create it. It becomes invalid. You, you decide how. Uh, a valid tool is going to tell you if the current tour bus is a varied tour bus or not. Uh, and there's a function called board. A board function essentially reads every single passenger and uh, creates it one by one into the array. So if it's a four, four passenger bus, it's going to go through four entries one by one, getting the information, and that's boarding. Um, and if everyone is boarded, it should set the uh, tour bus that the bus is boarded. So we know it is boarded. And start the tour, what it does is that you have to see if all the passengers are boarded. If they are boarded, you print starting the tour, and you show the passenger list as follows. OK? And that's it. So that's what you're going to create for DIY. So for uh, DIY, you are doing what my main is almost it in the other one. Like I was testing the seat. In here, you're managing the tour passengers. OK? And that has to, supposed to be dynamic, and you are supposed to create constructors and destructors and all the good stuff. Um, the, 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 the test program for it is like this. So I have a, a depart function that checks to see if a tour bus is valid or not, and it does start the tour bus. The reason I wrote the depart, and I didn't put this one over here, is that I wanted to see if you are making the methods that are supposed to be constant actually constant. The only way for me to test it is to receive a reference that is constant and see if I can actually call the functions. Okay? That guarantees that uh, those who are supposed to be constant are constant. And then over here, I'll go one by one. I get what is the number. Then I create a tour bus, check to see if it's valid or not, and go through it un until the number is four. If the number is four, then I will say depart uh, the, the boarding. So boarding over here is going to board everything and return the reference of the tour. Um, and the reference of the tour is being passed over there for uh, uh, departure. So starting the tour. And the program runs as follows. So it just literally tests uh, everything. And uh, then it runs a bus that is uh, with four passengers. So this is how it's happening. So it asks you to enter the following data. So 100, a tour bus with 100 is invalid. 10, a tour bus with 10 is invalid. 22, it is valid, but I cannot start it because nobody's boarded. 16 is valid, but I cannot start it because it's not boarded. When it's 4, I actually board it. So you put the names over here. 1, 2, oh, 3, and 4. And then it shows it to you, and you're done. Anyways. That's the testing for it, and uh, that's workshop number four.